Welcome back. Now we are going to study formatting, and actually we're studying F-string formatting. But there'll be a few mentions of the other kind of the format. First, motiv motivate ourselves. We're going to look at the module paint.py. And this is a program that's useful in a hardware store. Someone walks into the hardware store and you say to that someone, we have cans of paint. Each covers 200 square feet. How many square feet do you have to cover? Our customer says 203. You think an instant and say, hmm, that's two cans of paint. What did you do in that instant? You did the division by the 200, and you did the modulo. You decided, is there any leftovers? And if there is, you added another can of paint. So that is the algorithm we're doing here. On line 5, we are making the constant to be 200. This is a promise to yourself and all programmers who follow the style guide that you will never put per gallon on the left side of equal sign again. It is a constant, not enforced by the interpreter. So it is a style guide constant. Okay, square feet equals zero though, that's gonna be changing. While square feet equals zero, and it is, so that's true, we're going here. When it changes, we'll go into else. Because this became false, we go into the else. Here we know we have good data. We ask for the input, and if they didn't say anything. Now that's what that says in English, and many style guides insist on that. But it's good to understand that if the user didn't say anything, just hit the return key, then that input call will return what is called the empty string. It is like open quote, close quote. It is a string that has nothing in it. It is a falsehood. Like zero is the number that is a falsehood and all other numbers are not. The empty string is a falsehood and all other strings are not. So if what was said is that empty string, then we go into this block of code. If this is the same because Said, then, is a falsehood, and not said is true. And we go in here. And this is considered a better style. I don't care. But just so you know. Okay, then we take the integer form of what was given to us. If we can, we get the value error if this call to int failed. But if this call to int failed, that point where the square feet labels attached to that integer object never happened. And then we ask, please give a whole number, and we still have square feet equals zero. So we go around and tell either they give us some nothing or they give us a good number that I can make an integer out of. Alrighty, and here we are in our else, which means good data. We do the calculation of the integer division of what the user told us, and it tells us the whole cans of paint we need, number of cans, and we're gonna add one to that number if there are any leftovers. Well, that's exactly the specification that works. Alrighty, down here on line 20 and 21, we have two strings you'll see that between these two strings, there's the end, there's the beginning, there's only white space in between, spaces, tabs, new lines, whatever helps you. And then what the interpreter does when you give it two strings that have nothing in between them but white space is it concatenates them together and thinks of them as one string. That way I was able to put these two partial strings on two different lines without a backslash. Okay, after I say that, I do not move to the next line. Else, that's where there are some leftovers, so we, uh, <clears throat> where there are not any leftovers. Therefore, we need exactly that many cans. 
Now both of these end in the same way with just a space. So we're going to add here the answer. We only want to do the answer once because we don't like duplicate code or data. Okay, so here we're going to do the number of cans that was decided and we're going to say this string. Is this string going to be can because it's singular? Or can because it's not. It's either zero or plural. Okay, so we got our English in that way. And we saw a little formatting. Here we have an F string formatting cheat sheet. Let's look at it. We see that F string means that you have the prepend of that little F operator before your regular string delimiter and that delimiter can be any of the four delimiters that are allowed in Python. And when you do that, then inside your string, you can have curly braces. And the interpreter will interpret what's inside of these curly braces. What is required inside those curly braces is some code. It can be just an X. It can be the number three. The interpreter knows what to do with both of those things, and all things that the interpreter knows what to do can go in here. This part is required. If you care about taking exact control over the string that is prepared for you, then you also want to give a colon and a specification before the closing brace. This part is optional. Now we'll take a look at the specification cheat sheet. I'll point out right away that the horse's mouth is at the, you, this URL. Horse's mouth is American slang for the original source of the information. So here's where the truth is. In case I make a mistake, I'm trying not to. Okay, the most usual thing you might want to do is to give a minimum field width. And that is just an integer. That integer appears by itself, or if there's a second integer, the second integer has a dot in front of it. But this first integer is going to be the minimum width, meaning that if the facility needs more space than that width to correctly represent your datum, it'll take it. While we're looking at integers, dot n talks about the precision, and that means a different thing depending on which type you're asking to have represented. The default type is the str, the string, and it is shown as default because it has a purple circle around it. So we see there are other defaults here. Any object can be represented with the s it will never ever crash. Sometimes it gives you something a little bit ugly like what type of object it is and where it is in memory, but still it's really good information if that's all there is. These are the integer types. B will represent your number as binary. C as the Unicode character that it is, the glyph, how it looks. The D is base 10 decimal. Base 10 decimal is the usual way you want to look at a number. That's the most human friendly. With an N is exactly the same. These are aliases, one for the other. This is a lowercase O for octal, and that'll represent the number base 8, and these two X's, one or the other, will represent the number in base 16. The uppercase X will give you the A's and B's, etc., as capital. These six are the floating point types. F is the usual one for a floating point number. It gives the decimal point and by default if you don't give a precision it'll put six places to the right of the decimal whether that makes sense or not. E is for exponential notation or scientific notation. And it'll give the number with one place to the left of the decimal. And then it will give as many other places to the right of the decimal. It needs to meet the precision given. 
then we'll be the character E. That's why we have the E and another number, and that number is how to move that decimal place. 10 will say move it 10 places to the right, and minus 3 is 3 places to the left. So that's good for representing huge and tiny numbers. If you choose E and you use capital E, that's going to give you a capital E instead of the lowercase e. G is the general floating point type. The facility itself will decide whether your datum is better represented as an F or an E. If you use capital G and it decides that it should be an E, it will make a capital E. Now here we have a capital F. This is for the floating point item, not a number. N-A-N is not a number and it's very useful in data analysis. If you want that N-A-N to come out capitalized, you use a capital F. Percent might be useful to you. It will not only put a percent sign after your number, but it will, uh, it will multiply the number by 100. So those are the types. Let's look at the field character. The default field character is the space. However, for most types, the default alignment is to the left. For numeric types, it's to the right. That's why we have two defaults. This puts it right in the center. This equals is good for numeric types, and it gives you this form. Plus, with the fill coming after the plus. You can also get that by putting in here a zero. Gives that. Okay, that's that one. The default sign is minus, and that means it puts a minus sign on the negative value and nothing on the plus values. If you want a plus on the plus values, put in a plus. If you want to have a space just saved on the plus values, put a space. If you put in a pound sign, and by the way, things have to be in this order if you use them, the pound sign indicates that a zero should be placed before the B in the B type or before the X in the hex types or the O in the octal types. Then you get the E and then the number follows. Okay, so there's a whole lot of flexibility and you can get exactly what you want and just review this and if you're still confused, go there. Okay, great facility, F strings. Examples are always best, so here I give some examples of everything. Let's see what might be interesting. Here we have C, we want 165 displayed as its Unicode character, and there it is, the end sign. A string the, is croque monsoor, and we ask it to be printed out point two. That means only two significant characters, so we get CR. Here we are multiplying by 2 a short string, XO, and we are putting it centered in three times the length of the short string. And notice that there are curly braces embedded in the outer curly braces. So first this is going to take the place of what will come right there in the specification, the field width. So that would be in 6. Those four characters embedded in six. Here's some good little points. If you want to get the literal curly open brace, you put it twice in there with the F, and it will come out as curly brace. Look here, I did it with nothing else. But if I put X in there, I had to put in another pair of curly braces to indicate this is what you should execute. These two come out as a literal one, and you execute the third one. So you see that? You can do that. Another really lovely feature of Python is the 
R, the raw string operator. When I have a string, if I put R in front of it, I can do it with or without F, and they work in both orders, according to my test long ago. Hopefully I'm remembering correctly. Now I'm saying backslash index equals, and in here I'm doing the curly braces message, so the message should be F strings. And so what comes out? Backslash index F string. Oh, very good. So you'll want that if you work in tools like LaTeX or perhaps regular expressions that saves you. So here's the code that produced that output. You might want to look at it. You can see exactly how it got produced. We'll study about Unicode in more depth when we learn to read and write files, because that's when it pops up for you. But just because it popped up in the formatting, we'll look at this. The end symbol is 165. We know that. That's the Unicode. And if I say char 165, I get the Unicode character for that. So I can say that in here, char 165, and you see the Unicode comes out. Comes out. When I do the ORD, I get the 165 again. And what is the type of the 165? That's a string. Strings in Python are kept in Unicode. Now. That's the visual situation. But when you want to store it on a file or something, what does that mean? You can't write in there a yen symbol. You have to write in there bytes, zeros and ones. That's all there are. So here I am taking that yen symbol, which is a string, and I am encoding it into bytes using the scheme UTF-8. There are lots of schemes. There's a lot of history. Uh, but I have never had an occasion to use something other than UTF-8. So that's a big hint, isn't it? So far. You can see that I report everything before I do it. So we'll look at the output. Here's where we assigned greeting to the string hello and saw that the type was a string. And here I now can say greeting equals hello, printing it out. And now I'm going to use a built-in function bytes. I give greeting a string, and I tell it I would like it please to be encoding, meaning put into bytes, so that I could store it or send it through a socket. Okay, I want it to be encoded in UTF-8, and this is the answer when I print that. It has, uh, it looks like an ASCII string with B in front of it. Well, okay, so I'm doing it again because now I know that I just put a B in front of a string and I get the bytes. When I look at it, we see it is bytes. When I print it, it is bytes, but it is a string hello. And when I make a string out of it and I encoded it using the STR, I have bytes. But it's represented as the human readable form. Hello. Okay. When I try to use the B on a GIF, that's what it's called, the character itself, as I did here, if that GIF is not in the ASCII character set, I get an error. Hello, it's all in that character set, and that yen symbol is not. Okay, that's our first introduction to Unicode. Now, I left into the material the old cheat sheet on formatting strings. Just in case you're stuck there, I hope you'll be able to read this and that it'll help you. The samples. 
Here at the end of this, I talk about the, the division issue. This is in Python 2. If you divide 3 by 10, it throws away the decimal point. Unless at the top, you say from double underscore future double underscore import division, and then you get the floating point true answer. Oh, and if you want the integer, and you know you will for all of time, you want to use a double division instead of the single, because in both pythons, that means integer division. And as you know, the single slash means floating point when it's needed in Python 3. Okay, you're on for Lab 4 exercises. I hope you enjoy them.